This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast for everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level. You came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and was addicted to hokey pokey, but I turned myself around. My co-host is John Pasden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and was analog at birth but digital by design. In this episode, John and I discuss the situation of a learner who says he can read, write, and speak Chinese, but can't seem to understand conversation in Chinese. Guest interview is with Liz Hanlon. She started learning Chinese in high school and today works for a Chinese education publisher of a major textbook you may know. All this and more. Let's get to it. Hi guys, I'm Jared Turner. Hey guys, my name is John Pasden. All right, Johnny, we got a great podcast today. Yep, I'm going to kick it off with、uh, some reviews. Right, people have been reviewing us、uh, so nicely as we requested. John, you got one for us. Kick it off. All right, here's a very nice、uh, five star review. Finally, something about learning language. I love that this discusses how language is learned and tips for doing it. There's no silly vocab lists here. It's all helpful insight from the authors of the best graded readers out there, Mandarin Companion, and that's by Eric in the U.S. Oh, shucks, Eric. Thanks, man. I got one here from Dustin C M. He's also in the states. He says, "I really appreciate this podcast, and that's why I decided to write this review. It's never dull. I enjoy listening to the different interviews, and I almost always learn something new about China and the culture. The advice is also consistent and helpful. Again, I can't say enough." How much I appreciate this podcast! I listen to every episode, sometimes multiple times. Thanks so much, Dustin. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay, here's another one.、Uh, it's by Copen H in Germany.、Uh, he or she says, probably he. Yeah, says great stuff,、uh, great podcast, and super relevant to anyone learning Chinese. I really had to laugh the other day when I heard that I'm not the only one having problems to pronounce "chu chu." My wife and I come up with this sentence years ago. Which I am still having trouble pronouncing correctly. I want to go to the restaurant to eat Chinese food. The interviews are also really interesting. I particularly enjoyed the one with Steve Kaufman in current episode. He's another one of my personal heroes, besides you, of course. Thanks a lot for sharing all your thoughts and experiences with the community. Keep it up. Thanks, man. Actually, I gotta say,、uh, I find it amusing that a German says that "chu chu" is really hard because, like, all Americans, you know. Canadians struggle with that word, but I always thought that Germans would have an easier time because "chu"、uh, the vowel there is the "u" with the umlaut, and、uh, that's a sound that German kind of has and English doesn't. But it's still hard, apparently. It's hard for me too. All right, and we have the last one here from Alex R S. He says a fantastic show that talks about establishing and maintaining a proper foundation for learning Mandarin. Much of the advice is applicable to language learning in general, but what makes this podcast special is the focus on Chinese and its unique challenges. It helps that the hosts are entertaining, <laughs> and that they're riffing on random Chinese topics is interesting. Keep up the incredible work. Thanks, Alex. And、uh, hey, I, I guess we're entertaining, John. That's that's I'll take it. I'm sure they're talking about you, not me. But anyway, thanks, Alex. <laughs> All right. Well, today for our topic,、um, it came from a post on Reddit, and this is something that really stuck out to me because I think there's a lot of people that struggle with this exact problem that this person、uh, was was posting about.、And、I'm going to kind of abbreviate a little bit what they've said here, but I'm going to read just a few things from this person's post online. He says, "I can speak, read, and write, but can't understand spoken Mandarin." And that's the basis of what he's getting out here. Now he goes on to say a few things. He says I can, you know, read, speak, and write、uh, around an HSK three or four level. So you know, that's it's it's a pretty, it's a decent level. And the majority of his friends speak Chinese, a collection of Chinese, Taiwanese, and Malaysian. And so he has a lot of、uh, immediate contact with the spoken language. He says, however, I can barely understand a single thing that they say. And so he is he's trying to understand this. He's trying to say, hey, you know, I've been studying. I can understand. I can read a lot. I can write a lot, but I just can't understand what's going on. He's trying to decide: hey, is this because of accents? Is it because of maybe word usage? But John, let's throw this over to you first, and let's let's talk about this. What do you think is this guy struggling with? Why do you think he's having trouble speaking? All right. Well, first of all, we need to establish he's not in China, right? He says he has friends that speak Mandarin, but he's not actually living in a Mandarin-speaking environment, meaning it's a Foreign language for him, right? That's right. He does travel to Taiwan, 
frequently. Uh, he, he's kind of like a travel guide. But you're right. He doesn't. He's not like in like a Chinese speaking environment all day. Okay, so that's an important detail. Secondly, I think this comes back to something we've talked about before, which is the difference between a skill and knowledge. So you know, you can know stuff. You can know, you know, this word means this. But having a skill and being able to to uh, carry on a conversation, to comprehend what someone says to you and reply quickly, that's a skill and it needs to be practiced. So um, I know that he doesn't think that, oh, I'd learn it once and I should be fluent. He doesn't think that. But I think people still underestimate the amount of practice that is necessary to um, to get decent at a skill, even a skill as basic as just holding on a very, you know, everyday small talk type conversation. Yeah, you know, I think that's a very good point because it's it comes back to this uh, concept before that we talked about knowledge and proficiency, right? So he maybe knows a lot of Chinese, but it, even if you're able to write, sometimes when you're writing or typing, you're allowed to take a little bit more of your time. You can stop. You can think about that sentence that you're going to write. Uh, you know, you go back, you edit, you, know, you read it, you say, oh, maybe that wasn't right. And you go back and you change it and you fix it. Now, you have a lot more time when you're writing. But speaking, if you're trying to talk to someone who is trying to speak like that, they're speaking just very slowly, very broken. They stop, they go back and they try to say it, but then they realize it's not right and go back and fix their language. It's really hard to communicate with someone uh, you know, on a verbal basis in that, in that manner. Yeah. And actually, I want to give an example which highlights um, why the practice is so important. So you practice, you develop the skill, and that leads to proficiency, right? So um, let's take an English sentence, which is going to come up, you know, the Chinese version will come up in the very early stages of almost any conversation with a Chinese person, which is, where are you from? Now, as a native speaker of English, you think this sentence is so easy. It's only four words. Uh, I should be able to really quickly master this question and how to answer it. And then, you know, my my small talk is going to get good really fast. But that doesn't happen. And the reason is is actually specific to Chinese, Mandarin Chinese itself. So, Jerry, let me ask you this. How many different ways do you think there are to ask someone in Mandarin, where are you from? Oh, there's like 10 at least, probably more. Yeah, there are actually more than 10. And this is something that most people don't realize. They're like, oh, yeah, I think there's like one or two. No, there are more than 10. And uh, sure, some of them are more common than others. Uh, but just to give you an example, just nali and nar, right? Those are two different words, and they could use either of them. And there's just a whole bunch of other variables compounding it. So there's an, an example of something that you've probably underestimated already when you think about what you should be able to fluently say in Chinese at your level. And so when you discover that, what do you do? You don't throw in the towel and just give up. You recognize, oh, I actually have to learn more ways that people are going to ask me, where are you from? And I have to learn how to answer those. And then I have to practice those. And then I'm going to get good. So the things that you have to practice aren't necessarily the things that you think of immediately, the, the assumptions that you make based on English. And actually, I, I just recently wrote a blog post on a Sinosplice about this very issue, uh, all the different ways to ask, where are you from in Mandarin Chinese? That's a very good point. And this guy, he actually brings up a, an example of this because it, it actually highlights what you're talking about here, John, because he, he brings up a sample conversation that he had when he was trying to order something at a restaurant in Taiwan. And he said, uh, says, well, xiang yao ke le. So, you know, I, I, want a, I want a cola, I want a Coke. And then the reply, as he writes, he says, 你想要罐头还是瓶子? So, you know, do you want a can or do you want a bottle? And then he's like, I didn't even know what he was saying. And, and evidently he's writing this down because I'm going to assume that maybe a friend helped him maybe write this down or, uh, you know, decipher what was said and find he was able to give the appropriate reply. But what it seems to me we encountered was it was a lack of adequate vocabulary to handle that situation. And that's a little bit what you're getting at. So there's this, I think it's a combination of maybe understanding the different ways to say something. But also, if you actually lack a key vocabulary word, you're not going to understand what's being said, whether it's a question or a reply. And so I think that this guy, to a degree, I think he might be overestimating a little bit his, his Chinese ability. Because I, it seems that there's there is some gaps, at least in what he's trying to do and how he's trying to communicate, and so it seems like there's absolutely a, a combination of fluency practice, right? So knowing how to use the words and knowing the different ways that can be used, but also making sure that you have enough vocabulary in, it in order to communicate what it is that you want to do. 
But there's another trap you could run into here. If if you have this experience and you don't know guantou and pingzi, and then you think, oh, I need to learn those so that this can never happen again. Okay, it's not bad to learn new vocabulary, but actually both of those words are relatively low frequency. Those should not be at the top of his, uh, you know, must learn vocabulary priority list. But I will say, unless you are in China and constantly ordering a Coke and you, you get asked this question, then it's, then it's, that's when it becomes relevant, right? Well, yeah, but my point is, does he know all the different ways to answer where are you from? Um, if he does, great. If he doesn't, well, then you should focus on that. He probably actually knows all the words too. So it's not a, a matter of vocabulary. He just has to learn, oh, they can ask me this way and this way and this way. And if they ask me this way, this is how I reply. If they ask me that way, this is how I reply. Like he should focus on that because those are even more common. They come at the beginning of almost every single uh, discussion. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have conversations that aren't about ordering a cola, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, who knows what type of conversation you're going to run into? Right. So, you know, the where are you from thing, um, that's one thing. Obviously, there are a lot others. But the point is, it's not just learning the pattern and then, you know, practicing it a few times. You actually have to hear it in random conversations many times before it becomes natural. So I think one of the uh, one of the basic ways that people do this when they live in China is by taking taxis, especially in the past when it wasn't all app based, right? Like you get in the taxi, the driver asks you where you want to go, you tell him, have to make sure your pronunciation is good or he can't understand you. Then he almost always makes conversation by asking where you're from. So just by taking taxis, if you live in China, you have that conversation over and over again, and you probably have it more times than you think you really needed. I know people get sick of that conversation, um, but actually having it a whole bunch of times is what you need to reach a decent level of proficiency with just that simple aspect of conversation. Now, there's a few more points here, which I think are telling and illustrative of kind of the situation. Perhaps listeners may be able to relate with this. Now, he cites that his friends speak Chinese. But his friends uh, mostly speak Cantonese, and they're from Hong Kong and Malaysia. So uh, that's one issue, because Cantonese is not the same as Mandarin Chinese. But he says he speaks in few Mandarin phrases to them. And that's great. So you're practicing some Mandarin phrases and so forth. But when I asked him a little bit about, uh, like, what is your reading level? What is your reading speed? Now, I do ask this to people occasionally when, when I'm in person or online when they're asking about this. And I say, what is your reading speed? And a lot of times people are saying, like, well, wh what does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with my speaking level? And really, the answer is it has a lot to do with it. And I asked him this question. I sent him a private message and replied. And he says that he said that reading was quite easy for him. But because most of my learning was done in textbooks, much of the reading is a bit robotic and not colloquial. This right here, what this tells me, this is, comes back to the issue again of knowledge versus proficiency. The textbook is excellent at introducing language. It's excellent at helping you to, you know, know a new word and to understand and comprehend its meaning. But it is not good at providing the recycling and the familiarity that you need to develop the fluency. Also, you just need more realistic uh, input in terms of speed, uh, lack of clarity, you know, in real life, people don't talk like a textbook. And so if you've mastered that textbook content, that's great. But now you need examples of very similar sentences, which are spoken with accents, you know, different speeds, different levels of clarity and background noise, all that stuff. You need that practice, too. Absolutely. And this comes down to the concept of comprehensible input. And this is why John and I, we're always talking again about, you know, extensive reading, reading. We're always banging this drum because... Reading is one of the, I guess, most accessible and can be one of the easiest ways to get this comprehensible input that you need to develop the fluency. So one of the things that's important and that recognize it hasn't happened with this guy yet is that his brain hasn't developed the automatic processing of Chinese yet. And what automatic processing is, is, is when your brain just understands the language in Chinese. So, for example, like anyone listening to me right now, you are listening to my words in English, and you don't actually have to focus and think about every word that I'm saying. You just hear it and you understand my idea. You understand what it is I'm saying. You're not translating. You're not understanding any other, any other language. You're automatically processing it. And the same as with speaking, you have this idea and you're usually not thinking of every word that you're going to say. You just open your mouth and the words come out because your brain can automatically process the language. 
when you haven't gotten to that stage of automatic processing yet for Chinese, what's happening is that you're thinking what you're going to say in English or whatever your native language is. And then you're translating that into Chinese and you're saying it. And then when this person replies, you're hearing it back in Chinese and you're translating it back into your native language. This is, um, this is a very common thing and it's, it's normal. But in order to get to that stage of automatic processing, you have to have enough comprehensible input to be able to start understanding it in the language. And one of the great things about when you read something at a comprehensible level in Chinese or whatever language you're studying is that you get to a point where your reading speed is fast enough that you, you don't even have the time to translate it back into English in your head. And this is, it's a significant point that a lot of people will experience this. Anyone who has experienced this, you, you know what I'm talking about, that you just, wow, you, you're just now understanding it in Chinese. You don't even have to translate in your head. So this is why, you know, I get to that question, like, what is your reading speed? Because if your reading speed is slow, you're reading like, you know, 20, 30, even 40 characters a minute, you probably haven't gotten to that stage of automatic processing yet. Okay, but you're not suggesting that all you have to do is read a lot and get faster at reading to improve your listening comprehension. I mean, I understand that it can have benefits, but you can't completely neglect practice with listening comprehension and only read. No, I'm, I'm not suggesting it, but I will say that there, the research does show that if all you did was read, your listening and speaking will improve. But Chinese is also a little bit of a different beast because we have tones. And for most speakers who are learning Chinese, the language, the pronunciation is very different. So, yes, listening and speaking, I think, is even more important for Chinese. But, yeah, if you did only reading at an extensive level with high-level comprehensible input, then, yes, you would improve those things. But you combine it with the listening and speaking, obviously, that, that's what you need for Chinese. Okay, and as much as possible, you want more natural input, you know, people actually talking, not just uh, textbook recordings. Yeah, those textbook recordings, I mean, they have their place. But they're not going to provide you the large amount of comprehensible input that you need. Because, I mean, you know, they introduce a word and you get like one sentence. Uh, you know, that's not enough. Maybe if there's two sentences or even if you have like like a small article reading, well, you maybe have 300 characters in that small article, maybe 500. It's just not enough. I mean, a lot of this research shows that you need, seriously, you need like 50,000 characters. Like you need to be able to read 50,000 characters, 100,000. Some of the research for English learning shows that reading a million English words in a year is equivalent to studying abroad for a year. So I don't know how that we don't have enough research to establish that for Chinese. But yeah, absolutely. Read enough characters, get it on your belt. It absolutely is going to make an impact. Okay. But the other thing about textbook recordings is that they tend to be extremely clear and slow. And uh, in some ways, this is the equivalent of Chinese characters with opinion written right over or under. If you get used to that, you're going to feel like you always need it. So you do kind of need to push yourself to listen to audio, which is at a more natural rate of speech. And it's going to be hard at first. Uh, you're going to struggle. But if you don't practice with that, when you do have face-to-face -face spontaneous interactions, it's always going to be so hard. So, John, for someone who's learning Chinese, what do you think is a good speed for listening? So, that, like, if you have an audio recording or something, and let's say you can even adjust the speed of the audio, what do you think is a good rate for someone who's just learning Chinese? Well, I can't tell you percent-wise, but what I can tell you is that you don't want it to be so slow that it's totally unnatural. So, when you're just starting as a beginner and you're listening to audio, you want it to be as slow as possible, but still natural. Like, someone might actually talk this way. Right. And then as you, you get towards intermediate, you want the, the rate of speech to be like medium natural, not fast, uh, but not slow. And then as your Chinese gets better and better, then you want it to start skewing towards natural, but kind of on the fast side of natural, like some native speakers actually talk. So kind of scaffold it up. Yeah. Like you don't want to listen to unnatural input, but there's also no need to like listen to input that is natural, but way too fast. I mean, give yourself a break there and just kind of slowly ramp it up. So let's sum it up for this guy. So we talked about a number of things here. And let's say like if, we, if he was here right now, and yeah, who knows, I think he's probably going to end up listening to this podcast. So, hey, let's speak to you. And if you are like this guy where you say, hey, I can, I can speak, read and write, but I can't understand spoken Mandarin. Okay, here's, here's the advice that we would give to you. And now I'll speak from my perspective and then John, you can speak from yours. My advice would be, I think you need to read more. And I think that's a good first step is you need to get some graded readers. You need to start getting a lot of comprehensible input. 
And then you need to start practicing speaking with your friends. You need to move beyond phrases. You need to try to engage in conversations. And you need to move towards sentences. And all the while, we need to continue to study Chinese. So that would be my advice. John? So for me, number one would be practice and improve your skill at just very basic conversations. Things like, where are you from? You know, how are they going to say your Chinese is so good? And then what are you going to say when they say your Chinese is so good? These things that you know you're going to hear, practice them. You're probably not as good at them as you think you are. Uh, And then just work your way up from there. So don't jump straight to, you know, cola, bottles and cans. Start with the basics and make sure you're really solid there. Um, Another one is to get lots of input in natural spoken Chinese. So not textbooks, not computer speech but real people speak in Chinese. Um, So one way to do that is through services like ChinesePod or uh, Glossika or YoYo Chinese. There are lots of sites that can give you input. Just make sure that the audio is natural. Oh, and one more thing, just get lots of practice. Practice, practice, practice. I hope that was obvious, but um, that's definitely necessary. So I'd like to point out that you can learn to speak Chinese better, that you're not stuck, you're not doomed to being at this level. You can improve, you can move beyond your limitations, and you can learn to speak Chinese fluently and understand it fluently. Yep. Jiayou, man. Okay, now we have a word from our sponsor, and our sponsor is Mandarin Companion. Yes. Okay, so today we're going to talk about one of our most recent level one graded readers. That's 300 characters, and it is based on the classic novel Emma by Jane Austen. This book was one that was very dear to my heart. My wife is a fan of all things Jane Austen, and Emma is a classic Jane Austen story. Uh, We'd all lived in China for many years, and so she and I, we we adapted this story to modern-day Shanghai. So Emma, she is taken from Victorian England, where she was a socialite there, and now she is a fashion designer, an ambitious fashion designer who's married to her job in a fast-moving fashion company in Shanghai. It's a great story. All right, Jared, hold on a second. Let me uh, play devil's advocate and represent some of our manly men listeners. Is this a story that a guy is really going to enjoy? It sounds like a bunch of girl stuff, clothes and, you know, designer and Victorian England and all that. Well, I'll ask you this. Did you ever see the classic movie Clueless? I did. Because if you did and you liked Clueless, then you'll like this book because Clueless was actually based off of Emma. And uh, we actually did borrow a little bit of ideas from that book. And it's a great story. It's actually one of our best-selling books. And we've got great reviews on it. A lot of people love it, male and female alike. Oh, by the way, Jared, do you mind if I like uh, kick off a small Easter egg hunt right now in the podcast? Go for it, John. Okay, so the story Emma. Jared was the one who you know researched that and he watched Clueless as part of his research. Also, one of our new breakthrough level books it's called Zhou Hai Sheng. That one is related to the level one Emma book. Now, there is an Easter egg in the breakthrough Zhou Hai Sheng book, which relates to the movie Clueless. I'm really curious if any of our listeners can find this Easter egg. And actually, Jared doesn't know about it either. I told him there are Easter eggs, but he never found them. I didn't. I didn't find it. So I'll have to go take another look at that. And there are Easter eggs in all of our new books, by the way. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, so Emma, you can get it today. Go and get on Amazon, iBooks, Kobo. Uh, get your copy today wherever you get your books. Now we have rants and raves. John, do you want to kick us off? What do you got with for us, a rant or a rave? I have a rave. It's going to sound kind of funny, but I want to do a little rave for paper books. Because like I've been using electronic stuff exclusively so much, looking at a screen, looking at my phone, you know, using ebook readers. And there's just something really nice about having a paper book. And um, this is clear when we look at our sales from Mandarin Companion, people like to have the paper book. It's also clear uh, we have paper versions of the Chinese grammar wiki books. And sure, the electronic versions are great, especially if you can do a lot of searching or if you want to like, uh, I don't know, look stuff up in a dictionary on your on your ebook reader. But um, man, there's something great about having a paper book in your hands. And there's also a special feeling of satisfaction if you can read an entire paper book in Chinese without any of those special, you know, ebook tools. Oh, let's hear it for print books. Jared, have you ever read an entire paper book in Chinese? I have, yes. 
Don't you think there's something special about it that, that an ebook doesn't quite deliver? You know, I've seen some research that says that was like 80% of high schoolers prefer reading paperbacks as opposed to electronic versions of books. It's just, it's just more distracting, you know, when you're on an electronic device. True, true. Okay, so what's your rant or rave? Okay, today I have got a rant, all right? Now, this is also comes from Reddit. This is something I had come across a little while back. It was an AMA, which is an Ask Me Anything post. She says, I am an English as a second language teacher and author of English is Stupid. And her whole thing is talking about how hard English is and how dumb it is and it's stupid and it doesn't make any sense. And it just really like kind of was like, I was like, come on. This person, she actually doesn't speak any other languages. And I'm like, you know what? Honestly, when you and John, you can probably verify this is that when you get into like linguistics and looking at other languages, you find out basically that every language is dumb, right? I mean, every language has its own arbitrary things. Every language has its own rules that don't make sense. It's just that's just the way it is, you know, and Chinese obviously has its fair share of those. But so does, you know, like Russian or any Slavic languages. And anyone who listened to our last podcast with Stephen Kaufman, who speaks like 20 languages, that was actually very apparent. So anyway, I, my rant is about, you know, people like this who say, oh, English is so hard. It's a dumb language. It doesn't make any sense because, you know, that's pretty much par for the course for all languages. And, and Chinese is a special grade of that, too. I would agree with that. Yes. So arbitrary is the word that linguists like to use rather than uh, dumb or, you know, something that feels inconsistent. But, you know, languages evolve naturally. They're not planned. They're not super efficient in the way that we would like to see. They just evolve you know, with the people that own that language. What do you think Chinese is dumb? <laughs> Just as dumb as any other language. So my name is Liz Hanlon. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I met Liz this year at the annual National Chinese Language Conference in San Diego, California. And I've been studying Chinese for, I think, over a decade at this point. She has some pretty solid Chinese without having spent a lot of time in China. And now she works in Chinese education. I work for Chung and Sui, which is a Boston-based publisher of Asian language textbooks. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know Integrated Chinese. That's one of ours. Now that may sound familiar with some listeners because Integrated Chinese is the most widely used textbook in high schools and universities in North America. Liz will share with us her story on how she developed her proficiency in Chinese skill. Now, one thing I find illustrative of her story, if you listen closely, is the importance of pursuing your interests in order to maintain the motivation you need to learn Chinese. Stay with us. Okay, Liz, you said you've been studying Chinese for like a decade. So take me back. When did you start learning Chinese? How did that all start? So I started learning Chinese in high school uh, as a freshman. Um, I actually started off with French in middle school. So my, my middle school offered uh, French and Spanish. And I took French for two years. And it's a beautiful language. It was a little bit flowery for my taste. And my uh, high school Chinese teacher, um, shout out to Erica Pollard, came down to the middle school, the, you know, the end of eighth grade and said, next year you can take Chinese there's no conjugation. And I said, please sign me up. <laughs> and she, you know, she kind of glossed over some of the harder aspects of Chinese. Yeah. So I, I was, you know, kind of thrilled about that. And basically, as soon as I started studying Chinese, I just fell in love with it. I was, I was really drawn to the characters um, right from the get go. I didn't want anything to do with pinyin, you know, just kind of stuck with it all through, all through high school and into college. And so that teacher it lured you in. So I guess it was more of like, you know, I, I don't like French. Chinese sounds cool. Yeah. I mean, I had some notion of Chinese being a more useful language than either Spanish or French or um, certainly Latin, which is my, my third option. You know, at the time I was like, oh, I'll, you know, I can go do business in China or, you know, I'll find some use for it. So that that was kind of part of it as well. What were your Chinese classes like? I think they were just kind of standard. We used integrated Chinese. 
Erica Pollard, a fantastic teacher. I get to work with her at Chung and Sui. Uh, and I saw her when we, oh, wow. we met at a NCLC, the, the National Chinese Language Conference. I think I do know who she is. I think I have met her a couple of times. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. She's she's pretty active in the in the field. She does a lot with the um, the AP Chinese exam as well. A lot of stuff at the College Board. So it's um, sort of a traditional approach. The program was still very new when I was in it. I think it was you know two or three years old. So it was a very small class, um, but that was kind of nice, right? It was it was intimate. I got to know my classmates really well. Um, we had a ton of fun pretty early on. We're doing kind of soap opera skits about you know Wang Peng and Leo, and we I think we did a cover of Party in the USA, and and <laughs> <laughs> so we had, we had a really good time actually. But I knew that I wanted to continue at the college level. Um, so I actually went out and bought myself a, a copy of, I think it was like Modern Mandarin Chinese Grammar and, you know, kind of diligent about doing the workbook exercises and trying not to fall behind. And uh, well, Why did you decide that you wanted to continue studying Chinese? Going into college, I actually thought I was going to be a music major. So I had no plans to kind of do anything with it. But I liked the language. You know, I had fun studying it. Uh, I knew that I would have to meet a language requirement at, at college. And I figured, why bother starting a new language when I, I like the one that I've been studying? So it was like, it was just a, maybe a natural transition for you. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And so where did you go to college? So I went to uh, Tulane University in New Orleans, which does not have a large Chinese program. But I, I again, I thought I was going to be a music major. So <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> when I discovered very quickly that that was maybe not the best fit, I switched to international relations and Asian studies and really kind of buckled down on the Chinese. How was your experience learning Chinese in college versus learning Chinese in high school? I would say the biggest difference perhaps is A, my Chinese teacher in high school was not a native speaker of Chinese. Di Laosher's Chinese was stellar, but for the first time I was actually learning from native speakers, which was different in a lot of ways. I think some of the better native speakers um, that I had for, as teachers, I mean, they were, they were wonderful. Some of the worst instructors that I had, there could be an expectation where Oh, your Chinese is pretty good, but it's you're a foreigner. You're probably never really going to get it. Um, and unfortunately, I did encounter a few teachers like that. How did they treat you then? What was what was that like? I wasn't being pushed necessarily as hard as other teachers might push me, um, just because it was sort of like, oh, she's she's got the the gist of it, and you know we don't really have to worry. You know, if there's a mistake here and there. It's it's okay. It doesn't really matter. That was kind of that could be very frustrating at times. So it's like maybe they didn't challenge you, or they just thought, oh, she's good enough, or yeah. Like I would say it is just a matter of you know when you have a really good teacher, they are going to challenge you. You you know you might no matter how hard you you're already working, you know they're going to push you to get even better. And for me, I was I was kind of already motivated to learn the language, but I actually noticed it in a difference with my with my classmates. So in college, it was very much like, okay, I'm studying Chinese, not just because it's, you know, one of my only options, it's because I want to learn the language. You know, there were still students who were just like, oh, I'm going to take two years of it, meet my credits, and then, you know, not do anything. And so when everyone wasn't being pushed, it, you'd have the really eager students and then you'd have people who are just kind of being allowed to drift along. And so that was that was a little bit frustrating. But I would say that was like not the the norm. I, I had a very good experience overall. That's good. And then there always are. But I think it's also great because to understand sometimes the different challenges you have, because there's there's people out there who are going through exactly what you went through. Yeah. OK, so you're in the college program there at Tulane. But, um, you know, what what are some things that you did to really help your Chinese? I, it sounds like you, you were very interested in learning Chinese. What else did you do to you know, improve your proficiency? So I, I did a couple different things. One was I volunteered with the New Orleans Academy of Chinese, which was a Saturday school for primarily heritage learners like yeah I would volunteer with the younger children just as sort of a classroom aid just to kind of be around more native speakers around the parents around the children's children themselves just kind of getting like soaking up that extra input I guess 
I, that's when I started to read, actually. It must have been somewhere in freshman or sophomore year. I got a hold of a Chinese copy of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. It was definitely above my reading level, to be honest. But I was like, all right, I know this story. You know, I have Pleco. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this, no matter how long it takes me. And that was sort of when I, you know, I, I did eventually get through the whole book. It took me a long time. And that was sort of when I realized, oh, I can do this thing that I love reading, but I can do it in Chinese. And so I did start reading. That was kind of when I started reading quite a bit. Well, what was that experience like you for you getting through Harry Potter the first time? It was challenging. It was really challenging because if you think of Harry Potter in English, there are quite a few made up words. You know, it helped that I knew the story and, you know, could guess what a word I did, you know, the guess at the meaning of unfamiliar words. And, you know, I was looking, but it was frustrating because I was looking up every, it felt like every fifth word I had to go consult the dictionary. But then when I got to the end of it, it was, it was so satisfying because I was like, oh, I did it. I, you know, I read, it took me, it took me months to get to the end of it, but it was so satisfying when I did. You know, that normally when we talk about the, you know, this different levels of reading and when you're reading below 90% comprehension, that's the reading pain category. <laughs> it sounds like if you were at one out of your five words, that's like 80% comprehension. That's yeah. Pretty, that's pretty rough. I, it was, uh, the pain category was high. There was, <laughs> there was a lot of pain involved uh, in that, that first read through. Kind of after that, I kind of backed up a little bit and, you know, kind of went and read some children's books and, and things that were a little bit easier. Yeah, because usually we rec always recommend to people reading at higher levels of comprehension. So uh, I, usually it's like, you know, you, you, your comprehension really suffers when you're, you're reading that low. But, yeah. <laughs> but that's amazing. You got through it. So I, mean, I was curious about this. Most people, if they're reading at that low level of comprehension, they'll just kind of give up that book or something and, or maybe they'll switch to something different. Why did you stick with it? it? I mean, that was the first novel or short story or really the first piece of fiction that I had ever attempted to read in Chinese. And I think part of it was, it was just what I happened to have on hand. And it didn't really occur to me to go find something easier. And then I think the you know, the story, I, I'm a Harry Potter fan. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'm going to, even if I'm struggling to read this, I'm still going to enjoy the story. Well, that's great. And this illustrates a few points that I always talk about, too, is that like then some research that shows that you, know, you can work through these painful books, if you will, if they're too hard for you. But if you're really engaged with the story and it sounds like you were. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I find it's easier when there's a story. It's easier for me to remember, you know, certain keywords or, you know, even now, like uh, is uh, the Philosopher's Stone. Um, or the Sorcerer's Stone. I don't know what it is about having a story, but it, it it's just so, I find it so much, so much easier to remember. Well, I, I'm just thinking about this. Imagine if you had the dialects of Lao Tzu or, or know, yeah. my, my, Mein Kampf or something, you know, <laughs> you, you probably would have given up on those. But yeah, since it was yeah. something you actually wanted to read, you know, you probably you stuck with it. Yeah. So you're at Tulane, and uh, you were involved a lot of things there. I, from what I understand, you were also a Riptide the Pelican. Is that right? Oh my God, you did do your research. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I so I was the mascot at. Uh, I was heavily involved in uh, spirit activities, the marching band, uh, the pep band, and I was Riptide the Pelican, which was pretty wild. Um, it's amazing what people will let you get away with while you're in a, a big felt pelican suit. Uh, they will <laughs> they will just straight up hand you their infant children. <laughs> but now you also did a study abroad at Tsinghua, right? I did, yeah. So I actually did two study abroad programs. So I did uh, a semester the fall of my junior year. at um, It was through IES abroad at um, Beijing Foreign Studies University. And then after graduation, I ended up uh, going to IUP at Tsinghua. Okay, oh, Tsinghua University. So yes. everyone, that's a, it's like the Harvard of China. It's in Beijing. It's really well. I think it's it's the MIT of China, isn't it? And I think Beida or Beijing Dashi is supposed to be Harvard. Yeah, well, they'll always argue who. Yeah, it, it's it's a prestigious <laughs> university. Yeah. So so tell me about that experience. 
so IUP was fantastic. Um, it's IUP yeah, what is, is I, IUP? It's uh, the Inter-University Program for Chinese Language Studies. And so this is a, um, it's an intensive program that is run by, I think it's like 11 different univer- U.S. universities. So um, Stanford, Yale, UC Berkeley, a whole bunch of colleges with really excellent Chinese programs. It's a small program. The biggest class I ever had there was uh, three people. Uh, so it was usually three students, one teacher, and that kept me on my game for sure. Like there was no, you know, slacking off. And, you know, if you did not come prepared for class, everybody knew. What was the program like? I mean, it was small classes, but like, what, how do they teach you and how, how did that how did it work out for you? Sometimes it did feel a little bit like throwing, they threw a lot at you. So um, typically you'd start out um, with four hours of class every morning. I, I spent probably eight hours um, outside of class every day studying. At the beginning, you know, you would sort of everybody had to take similar classes um, until you reached a certain proficiency level. And then from there, you could sort of start picking what you wanted to do um, in one-on-one classes. Or they had, you know, certain classes. There was a film class you could take, or um, I took a classical Chinese class. At the higher levels, like once you reached a certain proficiency level, there was quite a a bit of... um, customization that you could do. So, um, you know, my major in college had been, um, you know, international relations, but with an environmental studies focus. And so I was able to take a class and it was basically a, a book that just kind of reported on China's environment and China's involvement on environmental politics on the world stage. Um, and that was what we used for the curriculum. And every day I'd come in you know, having read one of the essays in this book, you know, I was sort of responsible for knowing the vocab and coming prepared with discussion points and working one-on-one with a, with a professor, which was great, you know, but it let me learn the Chinese I needed to work in that subject area. Well, Liz, something I'm interested in hearing about your perspective is that, you know, to a degree, in learning Chinese, sometimes we have a we can have a confirmation bias, right? It's like, oh, this is the way I learn Chinese, therefore this is the best way or to learn Chinese. But I think, you know, you, you from your perspective, looking back on you know, even high school, college and your exchange programs, could you tell us perhaps like if someone was in your shoes right now and they're selecting some classes for their Chinese program or whatever, what do you see as some of the more effective things, ways that you learn Chinese versus maybe some less effective ways uh, or less effective classes? I guess for me, being able to learn the Chinese, I need to then go and do something that I'm interested in is, you know, I've never taken a business Chinese class, even though that's something that could be potentially useful, but I'm not going to be interested in it. It's I'm not going to be motivated to actually learn that no no matter really how useful it is, it's just not, if the interest isn't there, the motivation isn't there. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, it makes sense to me. I think it sounds like you're saying that if it's, if it's interesting, then you're likely to be engaged with it and, and therefore learn. Yeah, I, I think, and this is an idea that I had starting, when I started learning Chinese, that was, it's a useful language. Well, yeah, but that, you know, you actually have to use it and you're not going to use it unless you're interested and you're engaged. The native or the non-native speakers that I know who have the best Chinese have found something fun to do with their Chinese. So um, Jesse Appel, a former classmate of mine at IUP springs to mind. He's running the U.S. China Comedy Center in Beijing. You know, he does improv, bilingual improv. He does stand up comedy in Chinese and it's fantastic. And, you know, you can tell it like, because he's he's having such a good time. Or um, you know, I had a friend who has fantastic Chinese um, because she just wanted to learn enough Chinese so that she could watch all of the dramas. Um, she was really big into all of the soaps. And so, you know, she was motivated to then study up and so she could kind of keep up with that. Well, during the hard times of of studying Chinese, because I mean, we all have hard times, right? There's always some sort of element of a challenge. Uh, What's kept you studying the language? Why did you stick with it instead of, you know, saying, "Ah, I'm going to 
stop studying or just do something else. It's funny. I, I've, I really cannot remember a time where I've ever considered not studying it. And I think part of that is I, I take a lot of delight in the language, um, just the way that things are, are phrased or um, like Chung Yu are wonderful. Or I think one of the most difficult things for me is my reading is, is quite good. Where I kind of stumble with Chinese is speaking. You know, when I arrived in Beijing my junior year for study abroad, I was like, all right, you know, I've been doing well in Chinese class. Like, I'm ready. I'm excited. And then I promptly bombed, like, <laughs> just the first hundred interactions I had with non-NATO speakers outside of the classroom. I was just not prepared for accents or more informal speech. And I was like, I'm never, ever going to be good enough I was really fearful for a little while or it's like, am I ever going to be good enough to get through the day without face planting? I think what helped is just stopping for a moment and thinking, OK, I really bombed that. But I got through you know, the first half of that conversation or I actually um, I journaled a lot as well um, and just kind of would kind of say, oh, I, you know, I had a really great conversation with the Ai at the at the gate who who sells Jianbing. You know, then sometimes I'd flip back through and go, oh, you know, I did, I had that nice conversation. Like I I did, I can do this. Um so just little reminders of like, okay, this is this is something small, but you know, I was I was able to do it. I had some measure of success. Can you think back of any breakthrough moments you had in learning Chinese? I guess what springs springs to mind is just going back is is really the feeling of accomplishment when I first got through Harry Potter. But um, even after that, you know, then moving on to, you know, other short stories and other works of fiction. I had a moment at IUP where uh, we had a book club. It was a mix of students and teachers, but we read um, Kuang Ren Ji, Diary of a Mad Men by um, Lu Xun. I just, I just had a moment where I was like, oh, OK, I didn't think that I'd be here discussing a, a Chinese short story in Chinese, I didn't think I'd ever be at this point. I guess it's not really a breakthrough, but it was just sort of this, I became aware. I was like, oh, okay, I, I can do this. It's like, I'm speaking Chinese. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm getting somewhere with this. Well, it's, it's a significant moment, it, and it obviously sticks out in your memory as significant. One of the things too, Liz, that, uh, that I want to hear about your, about your perspective on is that we've had a lot of guests on this show who've learned Chinese, but they spend a lot of time in China or Asia. And you have spent some time in China, but just on some study abroad. For you, what do you think has been something that's helped you obtain the higher level of proficiency, but not have to have spent time in, in China? I did. So I did work a little bit after I studied abroad, but reading has really kept me sharp you know, when I haven't been in China, it's just, you know, whether that's reading like fiction or I used to read this uh, WeChat account that would post sort of these funny rants called Beimei Tu Cao. And, um, you know, just constantly reading really helps me like keep my language skills sharp. Um, and it, it still does, you know, and, and with the translation work that I still, you know, still do. I don't get very many opportunities to practice my Chinese all the time these days. And I think that has helped quite a bit. Well, it makes sense. I mean, there's mounds of research showing that the impact that reading can have on your language skill. And that's something we're always banging this drum on this podcast is you read. <laughs> so I, I, it would make sense to me. Yeah. And I mean, it's something that you can, uh, that I can always practice you know, on my own. I don't need anybody else. I mean, it's nice when I do get the opportunity to speak Chinese, whether that's with, you know, coworkers or, um, you know, every once in a while I'll bump into like a lost tourist in downtown, downtown Boston and get to help out or something like that, or, you know, just catching up with friends from Beijing. But it's something that I can always practice is reading. You know, there's always something that I can read. Well, Liz, if you could go back in time and talk to yourself, at any stage of your learning Chinese journey, uh, what would what advice would you give to yourself, or what would you say to yourself? You know, <laughs> this is um, maybe a little bit maybe a little bit odd. I would say take classical Chinese earlier than I did. Oh, really? Yeah, I really, really benefited from the classical Chinese class that I took at IUP. You know, because so much of of modern Chinese grammar comes from classical Chinese. And so structures that I was seeing, particles that I was seeing, 
I was no longer having to memorize those. I knew, okay, this is how they were used in classical trainees. So I understand, I I know why these structures exist in modern Mandarin. And the other thing that it, it helped me do was um, it helped me think in Mandarin. I think a lot of learners struggle with, okay, I want to say this particular thought. And you think of it in English and, and then you go, okay, how do I translate that into Chinese rather than just sort of thinking in Chinese? With classical Chinese, I would look at a passage and rather than you know translate that directly into English in my head, I was thinking about it in Mandarin. And so it helped me become a better thinker in Mandarin, actually. Uh, so it kind of helped me break that, that habit. Well, that's really interesting. Classical Chinese, that's a bit more of an advanced thing. So do you think it would have been better for you to do it earlier on or just uh, maybe not be afraid of it when you were ready for it? I think I could have taken it much earlier than I did. Um, I did not take that until the very end of my time at IUP. Um, so at that point, I'd been studying Mandarin at that point for eight or nine years. And, you know, sort of after I took it, I was like, oh, I should have taken that ages ago. You know, it would have made all of the grammar structures I'd learned, you know, for the past three years much more accessible. It sounds like it added a lot of depth to your Chinese. Yes, definitely. And what advice would you give to someone learning Chinese today? It kind of goes back to, like, find something that you enjoy doing and just do it in Chinese. I don't know how useful that is for, for very beginners, but as soon as you can, try like reading something that you like or try listening to a podcast that you're interested in in Chinese or try watching a, a television show or a movie without, without English subtitles. It's, gonna be, it's always going to be a little bit frustrating at first, but you know, if you're interested in what you're doing, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it so much easier to just learn the Chinese that will help you do that thing. Well, I think nowadays too, there are, for all those things you talked about, whereas books or podcast or even videos, there are low level beginner stuff up to elementary and intermediate and everything up above. Yeah, there definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's plenty of stuff. And also um, there are so many places that you can get recommendations. Just Google it online. Or I uh, found Reddit to be like the Reddit r slash Chinese has been really great for recommendations. There's a Chinese language learning discord. You know, there are these really great online communities of other language learners um, who might have really great recommendations. Yeah, definitely. I, I will say I am a little bit partial to the subreddit. It's a r Chinese language. That's the biggest one. I have another recommendation, and it's a silly thing, but I've gotten a lot of joy out of it recently, which is um, Gao Laoshu's Dank Memes is an Instagram account. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with this, but no. um, it's quite popular in the marketing department at Chung and Sui. My coworker and I are, have gotten very into Gao Laoshu's Dank Memes. Highly recommend it. It's like very niche Chinese language learning memes, but they're fantastic. And nobody knows who Gao Laosher is, but uh, <laughs> whoever they are, I salute you because it's um, it's it's a fabulous account. It's really, really funny. Awesome. Um, I'll have to definitely check it out. I, I, I love Chinese memes. We actually, I, I'm, I'm in the process of been creating a lot lately. So we're going <laughs> to, so Chinese memes are great. Yeah, you should definitely check out Gao Laosher's memes. All right, you got it. Gao Laosher's dank memes. Where I'm, I'll be all over that. <laughs> <laughs> you have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, pharmacists, secretary, handyman, Chinese teacher, baker, phlebotomist, engineer, and that one guy named Dylan. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at MandarinCompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena, we just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself. Yep, just me, Jared Turner. And I'd like to thank Liz Hanlon and my co-host, the man, the myth, legend, John Passett. See you next time.